Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today I'm here with Daniel Becchio and Stephen Nemesh. Nemesh. Oh, okay, you know what? <laughs> I've been trying my best, Stephen. I'm just going to call you Stephen from now on. Uh, thank you to both of these gentlemen for coming on to my show. As you know, um, Stephen has been on here before. Daniel was on uh, previously on an episode on the Trinity. So I'm not going to have them introduce themselves again. Uh, I think rather we can just dive right into what we're going to discuss today, which is uh, the ontological argument, or particularly their versions of the ontological argument. So before we begin, I actually want to pose a question to both of them, and then we'll go into Stephen's uh, ontological argument and then Daniel's. So here's kind of like a beginning question. So I remember, um, uh, I think it was, uh, you know, our friend August Diarchi, he posted a uh, uh, this uh, review from the from somewhere in like a philosophy religion publication that said ontological arguments are considered you know um, great sources of critical thinking of uh, human creativity and ingenuity but they ultimately are unsuccessful and I kind of thought like man that must suck if you defend the ontological argument you know that's basically someone patting you on the head and saying nice try kind of like a what was it Schopenhauer's reaction to the ontological argument it was a charming joke. So I, I want to get your thoughts on uh, the ontological argument as of now. So, you know, how it's understood, how it's been presented. And do you think people give it a fair rap? Like, is it really as bad as perhaps Schopenhauer would put it? Or what more is there that people are missing? So maybe I'll start with uh, Daniel and then I'll go to Stephen. Oh, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I, I have to say the ontological argument is probably what lured me into philosophy in the first place. Um, when I was an undergraduate student, I actually wanted to uh, get my degree in theology and I had to take some philosophy courses. And I quickly realized that my real interest was philosophy, not theology. No offense to Stephen, I know that you, you're more on the theology end. Um, but it was the ontological argument that really shocked me. I mean, the idea that you could deduce the existence of God from pure reason um, to me, that is philosophy in the most pure sense. Um, now, I agree. I mean, I, I tell my students that you can pretty much divide the divide philosophers along the lines of whether or not they endorse this argument. Really tells you a lot of their uh, philosophy, whether they're more rationalist, more empiricist, and whatnot. Uh, and what I tell my students is today there are real serious defenders of the argument as successful as sound. Uh, by successful, I mean, they would say it's actually a compelling reason to believe in God. And as sound, it, I think many people would have to say it's sound, even if they don't think it's successful, just because they would have to say the premises are true. Um, the real question is whether it begs the question or if it succumbs to some other fallacy. Um, and what I hope to do in today's presentation, uh, in, in my presentation, is to address what I take to be uh, some of the more standard objections. So I think it is actually a successful and sound argument for God's existence. All right. Uh, let me get now Stephen's thoughts on the current status of the ontological argument. I think that between the two of us, Daniel is the expert on the ontological argument, and I am just somebody with a certain curiosity. I'm sort of like Kurt Gödel, you know, coming along and like just thinking about a version of the ontological argument that might work, even though like my actual work is in another domain altogether. Um, that's uh, basically how I've come across it. I was just thinking to myself one day, I was meditating, you know, I guess on the, the notion of the intentionality of consciousness, because I'd that's a phenomenological notion, and I, I make use of uh, phenomenology in my dissertation. And I was meditating on the, the intentionality of consciousness, and I was thinking, okay, well, if consciousness is intentional, uh, to my mind, that implies that there is a kind of a, uh, an immediate you know, uh, contact between thought and its object, uh, and this contact is the basis for uh, anything that we might say about the object in question. And then I thought to myself, well, if that's true, then uh, this contact also has to set limits on what we can and we can't say about things. Um, 
the, you know, some things are contradictory or not on the basis of this prior context that exists between thought and its object. And then I thought, okay, well, what happens if we were to talk about pure actuality? You know, because my version of the ontological argument is an argument for pure actuality. Well, if we accept that consciousness is intentional, then when I think or I'm talking about pure actuality, that implies, so I say, a kind of a contact between my mind and uh, pure actuality. And furthermore, this contact dictates what I can say about the object. Uh, and it, uh, for example, it rules out the possibility that I say that pure actuality is not actual, because that would be a contradiction. And so therefore, I have a, an argument for you know, pure actuality, which is ontological in nature, because it's, you know, basically, I'm arguing that God understood as pure actuality exists, simply because to deny that would be a contradiction. Um, so, you know, do I say that the ontological argument is sound, or am I committed to it? I don't know that I want to commit myself to it, but certainly I think that there is something to it, um, or at least, you know, in my own formulation, I think that there's something to it. And I am not yet convinced that uh, there are, you know, devastating objections to it or like a real defeater uh, to the argument. So I'm not committed to the ontological argument, but neither am I neutral about it. I'm sort of like, you know, I have a, I have an interest in seeing whether or not it works. And when we try to figure out what an ontological argument is, so what properly belongs in that category, would it be something like um, the very idea of God is such that it entails, you know, existence or, I mean, or if God is possible, then he's actual, like, well, you know, how should we best understand what makes an ontological argument an ontological argument? Uh, Daniel? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there are many different types as many people have pointed out of ontological arguments. And I think the common theme is that they proceed from a combination of definitions and what I would call metaphysical axioms um, that are somehow necessary uh, and a priori. And uh, so the, the metaphysical axioms or premises as they function in the argument are supposed to commit us to some sort of statement about the nature of being. Uh, the, the formulation I prefer is the one by uh, St. Anselm of Canterbury, um, and I'll explain why um, when I get to it. But um, the other versions, we know uh, the, the modal uh, version that was uh, popularized uh, by Alvin Plantinga also talks about axioms based on modal logic. And modal logic, I think, is an attempt to carve reality at the joints and tell us <clears throat> exactly how possibility and necessity work. So a lot of people will say, oh, the ontological argument is one of those arguments where you try to define God into existence. And to me, I'm not sure exactly what that objection really means, unless it's something like this, that you start from a definition that of God, and then somehow deduce directly from that definition alone, the existence of God. And I don't know of any version of the ontological argument that I would take to be serious that does that. Um, I think most of them have a definition and the definition plays a central role in the deduction. Um, but it's always the case, at least it seems to me in, in, in all the, the, the ontological arguments that I think are worth studying, that they make some claim about the nature of reality as well. And therefore they're ontological in nature. They tell us, you know, what is greater, what is perfect, what is necessary, that sort of thing. All right. Well, today we're going to have uh, Stephen go first in presenting his new ontological argument. Stephen, uh, did you, what's the formal uh, name of this argument, by the way? Uh, there is no formal name for it. I call it a, <clears throat> I call it a quasi-Thomistic ontological argument with a phenomenological twist. But that's not very catchy. It's just something quirky and fun to put at the top. Of it it sounds like some like a like a Sunday that I'd order, you know, or something like that. I kind of like it. It's a it's a wild ride. It's a never before seen flavor of ontological argument. I, I like I, it. You know, I, so that that's that's my version of the ontological argument. It's I call it quasi Thomistic because again, I'm trying to prove the existence of God understood as pure actuality, 
rather than, you know, as a maximally great being, you know, that is essentially omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly good, or rather than understood as a, you know, a person or a community of persons, all of whom share the divine nature or something. I'm talking about God as pure actuality. And so uh, I'm not trying to prove the existence of God understood as a being who has a certain nature and has various properties. I'm talking about pure actuality, subsistent being itself, and whatever other formula Thomas Aquinas and other people might use who um, understand God in this way. I call it a quasi-Thomistic argument with a phenomenological twist because my argument proceeds on the basis of a certain understanding of the nature of the intentionality of consciousness. And I make use of, you know, perhaps creative use of certain insights and ideas that are present in Husserl and other phenomenologists, although I don't claim to be offering like a Husserlian ontological argument. I don't think that there is any such thing. I'm simply making use of ideas that are present in Husserl and other phenomenologists in order to present an ontological argument. Whether or not I am faithful to their system is another matter altogether. And to my mind, a less interesting matter. All right, so let me actually pull up the argument from your uh, debate on capturing Christianity with uh, Ben Watkins. Um, so here we go. Um, yeah, walk us through the argument. Do you want me to start with the presuppositions first or where, where, where would you like to go? Yeah, I, maybe we can start with the, the two presuppositions of the argument. Um, and uh, we can sort of work our way up to the argument. Let me see. So can... the, first, the first presupposition of the argument is that uh, contradiction is a sufficient condition for impossibility. So if something is contradictory, you know, it is for that reason also impossible. It is not something that can become actual. You know, whether we're talking about a square circle or we are talking about somebody begetting his own father, you know, any kind of object, whether it's a single thing or else a state of affairs or, you know, a, a conjunction of propositions or whatever it is, whatever is contradictory cannot become actual. Now, this is actually disputed. Um, and there's a guy named J.C. Beale who um, recently published a book with Oxford University Press, if I'm not mistaken, in which he argues that Christ, understood according to the Chalcedonian definition, is a true contradiction. Um, so he, offer, he argues that Chalcedonian Christology presents us with a true contradiction, um, and he tries to justify that on the basis of his preferred, you know, what he calls subclassical uh, systems of logic. That's all very interesting and fascinating to me, but I'm not going to get into that here. I'm just going to assume that if something is contradictory, for that reason, it cannot become actual. Um, and of course, that is to say that it's impossible. And the second presupposition of my argument, as you say here, is the, is that the intentionality of consciousness means that thought is an immediate contact with its object. Now, this point has to be explained some, uh, so it might be worth going into a bit of detail here. Uh, in phenomenology, you know, we say that consciousness is intentional. That means that it has an object. It is pointed at something. All conscious experience is an experience of or about something. And so, for example, I'm having various perceptual experiences right now. I see, for example, my phone. I see your face on the screen of my phone. I look around in my room. I see my table, my computer, my uh, beta fish in a small you know, little tank on the counter and so on. Consciousness is basically like always of or about something. It's directed at things. Uh, and so this is also true of our thought, which is another form of consciousness beyond our sense perception. Uh, thought is always about something or of something. If I'm thinking, I'm never just thinking purely. I'm thinking of something. For example, I'm thinking of the ontological argument, or I'm thinking about what I want to eat for dinner tonight, or so on. <coughs> now, one of the ways in which um, my argument interprets uh, this phenomenological notion of intentionality is that the intentionality of consciousness is immediate and not mediated. So what that means, for example, is that if I am conscious, if I have like an experience of something, what I'm experiencing is the thing itself and not a mental representation of the thing. This is an important way uh, in which uh, certain interpreters of Husserl distinguish themselves from others. 
you know, so, so according to some people, the intentional object of our consciousness is not the real world thing, but is rather something like a, a Freudian sense, some kind of uh, mediating uh, tertium quid that stands between consciousness and the world. Um, and when we are conscious of something, we are really conscious of this mediating thing, this representation, uh, which may or may not have a real world correlate. But on my preferred interpretation of intentionality, there is no mediating thing. Uh, I am simply aware of the real world object in a direct way. So for example, if I am conscious of my couch, if I see my couch, then what I am conscious of is not a representation of the couch or some other sort of thing. I, it, it is the couch itself. Uh, there is an immediate contact between consciousness and its object. Um, so now consciousness is intentional. That means that it's an immediate contact with its object. Uh, but what about thought? What does it mean to say that thought is in a, an immediate contact with its object? Well, when we think about things, we are performing judgment, right? We are judging that things are this and that way. You know, the couch is blue, the fish is red, uh, the laptop is open, the door is closed and so on. Now, Husserl has this passage in his book, Experience and Judgment, uh, in which he argues that the precondition of the formation of a judgment uh, is that an object be pre-given. Unless there is something there in front of me that gives itself to me in some way uh, for me to think about, then I cannot judge, right? Because there would be nothing to judge about. All of my judging has to have an object, and I do not create the object simply by making a judgment about it. It has to be there for me to make the judgment about, you know, before I make the judgment. So I say that the conscious, the contact between thought and its object is immediate, but at the same time, it is pre-categorial. And I don't have that on the presuppositions here, but I do have it on a more recent formulation of this argument. Uh, it's a pre-categorial contact because it means that my, content, my, my thought is in contact with its object before any judgment is made. And it has to be in contact with its object before any judgment is made, because otherwise there would be nothing for me to judge about. I have to have something before me, you know, in, in scare quotes, before me, in order for me to form a judgment. Uh, and so the contact between thought and its object is pre-categorial. I, uh, I don't simply, um, you know, create an object by forming a judgment. Uh, the object has to be there for me to, in order for me to make a judgment. But at the same time, this pre-categorial contact is not so close or so clear that I can't form false judgments about things. So although my thought is always in contact with its object, at the same time, this contact is not of such a nature as to prevent me from making false judgments. Sometimes things are blurry. You know, For example, I can see somebody from far away but I can't see them so clearly as not to be mistaken about who they are. So although there is a pre, there is a, a, an immediate contact between my thought and its object when I see someone far away from me, um, at the same time, that contact is not so clear or so imposing that I can't form the false judgment that this is so-and-so rather than somebody else. Now, con thought is intentional, all right? Thought is always about something. And in order for my thoughts to be about something, something has to give itself to me. And my thought has to be in an immediate pre-categorial contact with its object in order for me to form judgments about it. Now, at the same time, this pre-categorial contact not only makes possible the judgments that I can form about it, but it also limits what I can rightly judge. Uh, if something shows itself to me perceptually, then that is a form of you know, pre-categorial givenness. I'm in contact with this thing that shows itself. Now, it, it may be that it doesn't show itself so clearly that I could not form a mistaken judgment of what it is. But what I can't do is to say that it's invisible, right? If it shows itself to me perceptually, then it is not invisible. Although I, it may not be so visible that I can tell exactly what it is, right? So it can be blurry, but even if it's blurry, that doesn't mean that it's invisible. It just means that it's not clear. So what happens, let's say, if we start thinking about pure actuality, right? If I can think about pure actuality, that means that my you know, thought is uh, it has an object, namely pure actuality and not a mental representation or a concept or anything else like this, right? Because we've already said that uh, the intentionality of consciousness is immediate. It's not mediated through representations or anything like that. I can think about pure actuality. 
that means that I am in a pre-categorial uh, contact with this uh, with this thing, pure actuality. Now, what does that contact allow me or not allow me to say? It does not allow me to say that pure actuality is not actual, because of course, actuality is that in virtue of which I can call a thing actual, and pure actuality simply possesses actuality by definition. So if I am in a pre-categorial contact with pure actuality, and I cannot say that it is not actual, that must mean that it's impossible for it not to be actual. And of course, if it is impossible for it not to be actual, then that means that it necessarily is actual, and so it's actual. That's kind of the, the thinking behind the, the, uh, the ontological argument in my formulation. I cannot consistently think that pure actuality is not actual, right? I cannot ascribe an actuality to something that is actual by definition, something that is actual simply in virtue of what it is. So therefore, because that thing is not consistently thinkable, because it's contradictory, for that reason, it's also not possible, right? Because we've said that whatever is contradictory is for that reason impossible. Now, if something is impossible, then the negation of that is therefore necessary, right? So if it's impossible that, uh, you know, P and not P, then therefore the negation of P and not P, which is the same thing as saying either P or not P, uh, would be necessarily true. And of course, whatever is necessary is also actually true, right? So if it's impossible that pure actuality not be actual, then it's necessary that pure actuality is actual. And if it's necessary that it's actual, then it is actual. And so there you have my, uh, my ontological argument. So before I comment or say anything, I kind of want to hear what uh, Daniel's thoughts are on this argument. So uh, Daniel, I don't know if you're a phenomenologist. I don't know what your thoughts are on the second presupposition, but uh, tell me what you think so far. Well, I did, I did want to ask a little bit about <clears throat> um, the necessity of the, the, phenom the phenomenology as undergirding it. Um, but maybe I want to set that aside for a moment. I'll ask that secondly. Uh, the first is, I, I'm just curious how Stephen might respond to attempts at parody uh, to the argument by suggesting, for example, uh, that I, I'm in immediate contact with a purely actual unicorn, say, um, and whether or not that's susceptible. Now, I, I'm wondering if, for example, such a thought is... Um, is something that is given to me as a pre-categorial judge, uh, not judgment, but pre-categorically, uh, or is it a judgment that I'm forming? Am I somehow stitching things together in an inappropriate way? So maybe Stephen could, could address parity as a, a potential objection to his argument. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, and I actually, in the paper that I have written on this argument, I spend the most time, I think, addressing the parity objection. Um, and effectively, my response to the parity objection uh, tries to show that there is a difference between pure actuality uh, and what I call a this such. Okay, so here I'm once more going to use my preferred term of a this such. What is a this such? A this such is an individual thing with a certain nature and various determinate properties. Uh, so, for example, a cat is a this such, a human being is a this such, um, a table is a this such, a, a beta fish, right? a unicorn, for example, or the golden mountain, anything that is an individual thing with a nature and various determinate properties, that's a this such in my, uh, in my way of using the term. Now, <clears throat> basically my way of, um, of uh, responding to the parity objection is to try to show that actuality is not constitutive of any this such. Actuality does not enter into the concept of any this such. OK, and because it does not, therefore, when I talk about an actual unicorn, you know, um, I'm not talking about some simple object. I am talking about an object, namely a unicorn, to which I have synthetically predicated actuality. Um, and so really, when I talk about the actual unicorn, I am, dis I am disguising a certain uh, a synthetic judgment that I've made. I'm talking really about a unicorn, which is actual. OK. Now, how do I show that actuality does not enter into the constitution of any of this time? Um, I basically appeal to what 
past critics of the ontological argument have said. Uh, so, for example, David Hume. David Hume says that it is not uh, a contradiction, even though it may be contingently false, to say of anything that it does not exist. Right? So there's no contradiction in saying that Stephen does not exist, even though it's contingently false to say that. Now, why is it not a contradiction? Why is it a contradiction to say that Stephen is not human, uh, but it is, uh, why would it be a contradiction to say that Stephen is not human, but it would, it would not be a contradiction to say that he does not exist? Because uh, my existing is not, uh, it does not enter into my constitution as a, as a this such. My humanity does, right? So I'm a this such, I'm an individual human being. And so to say that I am uh, not human is to deny me something which belongs to me as a, as a matter of my suchness. The, the humanity of something, you know, the humanity of a human being or the validity of a cat or whatever, enter in, enters into its suchness. You know, it, it's, it's a way that a thing is such. Um, so when something has, you know, a certain suchness and I deny that suchness of the thing that has it, that's a contradiction. If I say that the red fish is not red, that's a contradiction. If I say that Stephen is not a human being, that's a contradiction. But it's never a contradiction to say that the red fish doesn't exist or that Stephen doesn't exist because existence does not enter into the constitution of the this such. Existence is something else. Existence is something outside of the this such, which has to be synthetically predicated to it uh, if we're going to you know, make a, a true judgment about something existing. So might I, uh, might I ask this? Why can't someone simply stamp their feet and insist through stipulation that their unicorn is such that it is actual? In other words, they're including it in the analysis of this thing they're defining. If you don't like unicorn, we'll call it a schmoonicorn or something else. You know, this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so like really just like, this is how I'm stipulating this thing. It, it has to have actuality in it. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I would simply say that. And the notion of a this such, um, uh, which is constituted by actuality, doesn't make any sense because, um, again, actuality is not thisness and it's not suchness, right? We have this such as, for example, uh, that are not actual. The things that I dream about, the things that I, you know, see, for example, in fantasy or when I'm lost in my imagination, say I'm imagining myself, you know, lecturing at some grand university. All those people that are in the stands as I'm lecturing, they're this such as they're individual things with properties and so on, but they're not actual, right? Actuality is something other than thisness and suchness. Uh, so that um, it simply does not make any sense. It's, it's, it's a contrivance. It's something, it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a myth to talk about a this such, uh, which uh, is constituted by actuality. Actuality is not the right sort of thing to enter into the constitution of a this such. It's not a, it's not this and it's not suchness. Actuality is something other than suchness and this. Um, actuality, if we really think carefully about what actuality is, um, I say that actuality is actually um, a a relation. Actuality, in my mind, is an actualizing relation in which something stands relative to pure actuality. Actuality is constitutive of pure actuality, but at the same time, we have to say that actuality, pure actuality is not a this such. So when you know, Aquinas talks about God as pure actuality, he does not think that God is an individual thing with a nature and various determinate properties. You know, Aquinas says that God is not even in the genus of being. Um, so that's, you know, and in this way, he echoes other uh, uh, thinkers in the Christian theological tradition, for example, like John of Damascus, who says that God is not a being, uh, he's beyond being, he's beyond the order of beings, and he's beyond being. Uh, he is not an individual thing. He's not one more thing among others. God is pure actuality. He is pure subsistent existence itself. He is not an individual thing that exists. Um, and everything, every individual thing that exists can only exist if this pure actuality, uh, you know, sort of you know, one, one image that I have in my mind is that of like a ray gun. You shoot a ray gun and you like burn a hole in the wall, right? The, the, the existence of things is like a ray that is shot out from God uh, and which actualizes them. Or it's like the, the projection that comes out of a projector and projects a screen, an image against the screen. The thing itself is the image. 
right? The being projected, the projection is not the image. Uh, the image is on the screen. The projection is what is happening to put the image on the screen. Um, and so that's how I think of actuality. You, you, you know, you could not have an image of its own projection. It, the projection does not go into the image. The projection is something outside of the image um, and in virtue of which the image becomes visible on a wall. By projection, I mean, of course, the fact of being projected, the being projected of the image. Uh, so I think that basically what I would say, I mean, this is sort of a long-winded response, but what I would say to this objector, Daniel, is that if we think carefully about what actuality is, we will find that actuality is not like salinity or humanity or being red or being tired or whatever. It is not a, another property that can enter into the suchness of a thing. Actuality is always outside of the this such as a whole. Um, and uh, and so that's why you cannot have a this such that is you know, defined into actuality. On the other hand, God as pure actuality is not a this such. He's not an individual thing. Right? David Hume is right. Of any individual thing with properties, we could always conceive that it doesn't exist. But I cannot conceive that pure existence itself doesn't exist, and that's because pure existence itself is not an individual thing with properties. Um, you know, this supposedly, you know, necessarily actual unicorn, that would be an individual thing with properties, and I could just as easily imagine that it doesn't exist. Uh, that is because existence is not the sort of thing that enters into something's, you know, constitution in the way that, a, you know, this purported uh, hypothetical objector is supposing. Existence is something else. Uh, existence is uh, not constitutive of the this such, and so therefore it's never a contradiction to say that a this such doesn't exist. But it would be a contradiction to say that pure existence doesn't exist. It would be a contradiction to say that pure actuality is not actual. Uh, and so that's why my argument is immune, so I say, to the, mm. the parity objection, because I distinguish between pure actuality and, you know, a this such. Well, I, I anticipate, or I, I hope, <laughs> Uh, that my own comments about parity objections actually kind of maps onto what you're saying in that I think there, there is something of an introduction of composition into the concept of a thing whenever you try to do a parity. In other words, whenever you're doing a parity, you're saying, and I'm going to add whatever you want to call godhood, pure actuality, maximal greatness, um, being that then which none greater can be conceived, whatever you want to however you want to capture divinity, whenever you're doing a parody, you essentially have to stitch that concept onto something else, the, par the object of the parody. And that's going to be a problem. And I think it's something I'm going to talk about too. But I think that's what you're saying is, is when you do that, you're necessarily in the category of an individual uh, this such, right? So you're right. already, yeah. So the, all right, good. Um, and so on, if you don't mind, my other question is, does this have to be cashed out in terms of phenomenology or could any sort of realist uh, use this argument to get off the grounds? In other words, something like a Platonist or an Aristotelian Thomist who believes that the mind is in direct contact with reality, whether it be formal reality or something like that. Or, you know, in other words, are we just sort of rejecting conceptualism, nominalism, uh, representationalism, uh, like Locke or something like that, when we when we're when you're making these sort of moves, or does it have to be phenomenology? Um, well, there's a paper that Norman Geisler wrote um, in which he, you know, it was titled "The The Missing Premise in the Ontological Argument," and it was published, I think, in Religious Studies, you know, some 40 years ago in 1973 or something like that. And he says that the missing premise in the ontological argument, which secures its validity. Uh, is that the rationally inescapable is the real. Okay, whatever is rationally inescapable, whatever we cannot avoid affirming in order to maintain rationality, that is also the way the real world is. Um, so <clears throat> given that this premise holds, my suggestion would be that a, a closer, you know, more uh, phenomenological understanding of the intentionality of consciousness um, and using that notion of the intentionality of consciousness and applying it to thought helps to bring out how this missing premise can be true. You know, how is it that the rationally inescapable is the real? Well, because when we are reasoning or when we are engaged in you know, rational discourse or rational thought, we are not operating in this closed sphere of the mind right? that has no essential connection to the outside world. 
you know, just like, for example, in phenomenology, the things that I see are not like a projection that my brain makes as a result of physical processes, you know, interacting with the environment. If I see the chair, it's the chair that I see and not a projection of a chair that has occurred as a result of things happening at the atomic level or whatever. I see the, the real chair, the real object. I'm in direct contact with it. Um, so in the same way, when I'm thinking, I'm not simply performing rational operations on concepts in my mind and seeing, you know, like, well, these relations, uh, these relations necessarily hold, um, you know, but that, you know, even though the relations between my ideas are necessary, it doesn't mean that they correspond to anything in the world. I think that reasoning also is a way of, you know, having a kind of a back and forth with the world. The thought, you know, when I form a judgment, I am not simply putting together ideas in my mind as if the world, you know, might not have any correspondence with them. What I'm trying to do when I reason, or so I say, is I'm trying to form my mind in a way so that I can see things as they are. Just like I might try to focus my eyes so that I can see what's far away from me if it's not immediately clear, or just I might, just like I might try to position myself in a certain angle uh, so that I can see, you know, the whole facade of a house or the whole front of a house so that I can see how it how it was painted and so on. When I reason, I am trying to adjust my stance towards the world, specifically from the point of view of you know. Of, uh, judgments and, con and uh, categorical judgments and so on, so that I can see things as they are. I am trying to have this back and forth, this, this, uh, this interaction with the world at the rational level rather than at the perceptual level uh, in the hopes of seeing things as they are. So if I find that I am forced to uh, perform certain judgments, I cannot avoid making certain judgments, um, something is rationally inescapable. Well, then in order for that to have ontological significance, I have to assume that when I'm reasoning, I'm not just performing operations on my ideas, but I'm actually interacting with being. I'm interacting with what is out there. Um, so in my mind, this, this consideration of the intentionality of consciousness and its appropriation in the present context you know, to the matter of thought and its relation to its object is essential. That explains how it is that you can have something be both rationally escapable and real. Because when we're reasoning, we are directed at what's real, not at ideas in our minds that may or may not have any kind of correspondence. Now, you might ask the question, okay, how is it that I can reason about things which, are, which don't exist, right? What am I reasoning about if a thing doesn't exist? I would say that I'm always reasoning about something, but it doesn't follow that I'm reasoning about something actual. So I think, for example, that uh, the various things that we can reason about and so on need not be actual. Some of them are merely possible. Some of them are actual in addition to being possible. Uh, and some of them are impossible. Uh, so I would say that our thought is always in a kind of an immediate pre-category contact with its object. But this contact is not the same thing as saying that the object is actual. Right? All the things that I might think about are there in front of me. They're given to me. But they're not necessarily you know, the fact that they're given to me doesn't mean that they're actual. I have to discover whether they're actual. You and could so, be escaped, you know, suppose, right? You, you could escape that? the idea. Well, you could escape the idea that it's actual as Descartes does through his method of doubt, right? You can you could say, well, this is an illusion. This is uh, fictional. Right. It's, you know, it's, right. you know, you could do that and parse away all of those things. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting enough to me that Descartes couldn't do that for God either. So... Well, what's interesting in my mind is that the fact that I can treat a thing as not actual when it is mm -hmm. tells me that the actuality is not a part of the thing, right? I, if, if, for example, I could talk about my chair as not actual, that means that my pre-categorial contact with the chair is not of such a nature uh, that its actuality is evident, right? The chair is given to me and I can think about the chair but its actuality is not. The actuality, like I was saying earlier, is something outside of the chair. Uh, the chair by itself is not actual. The chair by itself is, in my you know, own opinion, is at best a mere possible. Uh, and this mere possible may be actualized or it may not be. Um, and the fact that I can talk about the chair as a mere possible while leaving to the side the question of its actuality suggests to me that its actuality is not something that is given. It's, it's actu the actuality is not something that is there when I'm in contact with the chair. 
um, right? So the chair is given, but its actuality is not. So the actuality is outside of the chair. Now, when we talk about pure actuality, the situation is different, all right? Pure actuality is given to me as actuality. I can, I would only ever contradict myself if I were, if I were to say that pure actuality is not actual. And so um, <clears throat> what I'm suggesting here is that uh, something holds in the case of pure actuality, which does not hold in the case of any other object that I might think about, like a chair or whatever, namely that actuality is constitutive of it. Actuality enters into its constitution in the way that it doesn't for the chair. Now, here's another question that you might be thinking. Okay, well, haven't I just like invented a concept and defined it into existence? No, I don't um, think that. <clears throat> I don't think that we have like a pre-categorial awareness of everything from the very start. You know, in experience, we are introduced to new things and new objects are, you know, are made a, are made a, a present to us over time. You know, there was a first time I saw a car, there was the first time I saw a cell phone, there was the first time I saw a laptop. So various new objects are introduced to me in experience and then it becomes possible for me to think about them once they, once they have uh, become an object for me once. You know, the, after the first time I see a laptop, I can begin to think about laptops. Uh, and the more of them I see, the better I can think about them. I am assuming that there was a first moment when pure actuality became a thought for somebody, right? So I am not suggesting that uh, we simply have defined something into existence, right? Pure actuality uh, itself became an object of thought for somebody at some moment in time, maybe starting with Parmenides uh, or whatever, uh, but it was there for us to think about and then later it was discovered and then upon discovering it, we found out that we could not say that it doesn't exist. Uh, so um, this, is a, this is an ontological argument which at the same time does not um, you know, maybe for this reason it is not an ontological argument, but at the same time, I don't mean my argument to uh, undermine the role of experience in introducing us to objects. Um, I don't mean to undermine the importance of experience in the world uh, as the source of our knowledge of things, right? That's a properly phenomenological uh, notion, right? Experience is where we learn about things and it's where the world shows itself to us. So experience is the final arbiter of, uh, of what we can say philosophically. Um, and I, I would just emphasize that, okay, at some point, in some way, we were able to come across this notion of pure actuality. Pure actuality, of course, we are talking about a thing and not a, about a concept. So pure actuality in some way had made itself apparent to somebody at some point in time. Uh, and once that contact was achieved, we were able to think about it. And one of the things that we learned, we could not say about it, is that it is not actual. And, you know, hence we have the, the argument. All right, so Stephen, let me try uh, just to pose some, I don't know, questions or objections, and I, I hope these are softballs, you know, but, um, okay, so suppose that, um, I don't know, like, let's say um, someone says, look, um, you know, it's not consistently thinkable that, uh, I don't know, like, let's say, um, like, you know, with a, this such composition, right? So I can think about like a red square. I can think about a red um, book. I can think about a red chair, right? And um, it seems as if, you know, like that, that thing could not be red. That thing could uh, be some other color, right? But when it comes to, let's say, um, uh, redness itself, redness as such, right? I can't deny redness as such. So maybe, I don't know, is that like a, a, a way that someone could conceive of existence, you know, like, um, uh, what am I trying to say with this? I'm trying to say like, um, you know, if, if someone were try to try to run like a, a parody, right? So I think you did a good job explaining that pure actuality is not really subject to parodies because it's not a this such, right? But I mean, um, could someone say, uh, well, we could use this to define other abstractions. Like, you know, for instance, I think uh, Descartes said something like, uh, even though he uh, could not disprove uh, the, you know, the, uh, uh, that maybe external objects are illusory. He said like there are these like these simple ideas that we can't do away with, right? So is it possible then to just, uh, you know, say that maybe these things uh, by necessity, right, come, uh, are, are necessarily existent or I don't know, like uh, why does it have to be pure actuality? Why can't it be a square or, a, a, you know, a, the laws yeah. of logic, right? <clears throat> so I think I understand what you're, what you're saying. 
Yeah, it was um, a bit confusing. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think I get it. So you can tell me if I've misunderstood you. I would say the following. Um, when I think about a chair, for example, okay? I think about a chair. What is the chair in itself? Well, the chair is perhaps an arrangement of various materials in such a form uh, that it permits you know, the average sized human to sit on it, okay? This chair has a certain shape. I can imagine other things with exactly that same shape. This chair has certain material composition, so I can understand, uh, I could imagine that other things are composed of the same material as this chair. <clears throat> now I can think about the chair and I can discover any number of things about it while remaining neutral or uncertain on the question of whether or not this chair actually exists, right? I can, you know, so for, so for example, I can be talking to you right now about a chair that uh, I'm, you know, expecting to buy at a furniture store and you and I are talking about it and I'm describing it to you and you understand exactly what I'm saying. And then when I go to the furniture store, I find that the chair has been destroyed. Okay, just because the chair did not exist in actuality as I was talking about it, doesn't mean that I couldn't talk about it or that what I was saying wasn't right. I was able to talk about it and I was able to get you to think about the same thing together with me, even though that chair had been destroyed in the meantime. So to my mind, that suggests that the chair is not in itself actual. The chair in itself is not an actual thing. It's a possible thing. That's why you and I can both think about it and talk about it, even while in the meantime, it's been destroyed and neither of us knew that. Right? So we can both talk about the chair, we can both understand it, we can both like share our knowledge about the chair and so on. In the meantime, the chair has been destroyed. That suggests that the chair, which you and I are both in contact with because we're talking about it, is not an actual thing by itself. In itself, it is not actual. The actuality is something added to it. Now in itself, the chair is a possibility. So I wouldn't say that the chair is nothing just because it isn't actual. In itself, the chair is a possible being, so I say. And of course, what is possible is necessarily possible, right? This is a, Daniel knows better than me the, the axioms of modal logic. I forget which one this one is. Maybe it's S5 or maybe it's a different one. But if something is possible, it is necessarily possible. And yes. so we can, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, no, no. <laughs> yeah. That's an uh, so I, S4, yeah, S4. S4, right. So I, think you I would say answer. that the chair, right, the chair is, an, is a possible thing. And so we can't do without the chair. But its actuality is not necessary. The chair is contingently actual, although as a possible thing, it is necessarily possible. So that's how I would respond to your question. Uh, yeah, my, again, yeah. here, or what? So, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that my question was kind of a mess. So basically, I was just trying to say, like, I mean, you know, so could someone say, like, oh, it's not consistently thinkable that pure, I don't know, and then you, you put in whatever you want afterwards. So pure this, pure that. So then you could use this this adjective of pure to just, I don't know, define all sorts of things into existence. I, that was kind of a confused objection or question. Yeah. Well, what I would say to that is if we talk about a pure chair, yeah. the pure chair is precisely a possible object. Ah, okay, good. Not there we go. Object. There right, we that's go. what I would say to that. The pure chair is, an, is a possible object. The pure chair uh, has to be made actual, right? It has to be conferred actuality in some way, however it is that that takes place. And so the chair by itself, right, in abstraction from everything else is not actual. It is a possible object. That's what I would say. Okay. And then uh, another question that I have is I remember like when, uh, when, uh, uh, was it Oppie or is it Opie or Oppie? I call him Oppie. Oppie. Oppie okay. Yeah, usually. yeah. When Oppie, uh, debated Ed Fazer on the, um, the, the Deante argument, right. Uh, I remember, um, he said something like, well, you know, um, you know, think about like, uh, this, I don't know, this cup, right. It, this cup exists. And for this cup to exist, it's essential that it exists. Right. So that existent, the existence of this cup, uh, you know, uh, th there isn't like a real distinction, let's say, let's suppose between it's, it's existence and its nature as such, all right? So, so I, I know that you've responded to this, but I, I've heard this common objection or this common kind of um, intuition that some people have that, well, well, no, like um, it seems as if existence is essential for some things, right? So um, we can't posit this distinction that you would like the argument to, to have between what's possible and actual, you know? 
um, for some things, existence is uh, is ne essential or necessary for it to be the case. Uh, how would you go about responding to something like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that this is just confused, you know, analytic yeah. philosophical bullshit. I think it's just like, okay, well, the essential is whatever we, you know, we have to say about a thing. You know, it would it would always be true to say about a thing. Um, I. You and I can talk about something, and we can be talking about the same thing, and we can remain unaware of whether or not it exists, okay? Let's say you and I are talking about uh, a theoretical postulate in contemporary science, okay? You and I can know what this postulate would be, what exactly the sort of object it is that we're postulating, what it accounts for, what it's supposed to explain, right? What are the other you know, uh, possible scientific consequences of the real existence of this thing? We don't know whether it exists, but we know what we're talking about, okay? Suppose that this theoretical postulate is a, um, you know, has certain physical property P, okay? By definition, it has that property P. You and I would both agree. It would be a contradiction to say that this theoretical postulated object, theoretically postulated object is not P, okay? That's because by definition, it's, a, it, it's P. But we both agree that there is no contradiction in saying that it doesn't exist because we yeah. both agree that we don't know whether it exists. Mm -hmm. So it seems, it seems to me clear, right? Obviously, if a thing exists, it exists. But does a thing have to exist? No. Does a chair have to be, you know, an artificial object which is made for the purpose of sitting? Yes, because that's what a chair is. But does a chair have to exist? No. Does a cat have to be feline? Yes. Does the cat have to exist? No. Mm -hmm. uh, does this theoretical postulate have to be P? Yes. Does it have to exist? No, we don't know whether it exists. It's possible that it doesn't. So it just seems to me clear that people who think of existence as this kind of a pr property that everything has, and because everything has that property so long as it exists, therefore it's an essential property. Mm -hmm. This is just a confused notion of what the essence of a thing is. Uh, you know, the essence of a thing is not every property that it has in every conceivable situation in which it exists. That's not what an essence is. An essence goes into defining the thing. It enters into you know, the structure of the thing as an intelligible object, and it gives it a certain character. Validity is a part of the, the intelligible structure of a cat, and it gives the cat a certain character. It makes it what it is. Humanity is a part of the intelligible structure of a human being, and it makes the human being to be what it is. Right? Humanity is a certain content. Existence is not a content. Existence is, is nothing, strictly speaking. Right? There's no difference like Immanuel Kant said. There's no difference between a hundred possible coins and a hundred real coins in terms of content. The only difference is in terms of existence, which is not the content of a thing. It's something else outside of the thing. Mm -hmm. So that's how I would, I would respond to that. Right. Objection. So it's I like, a, it's, a, it's, it's a fallacy to say like, it is essential for a cat to exist that it exists and then deriving from that. Therefore the cat must exist. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. Right. There I mean, we go. Yeah. So I would say that like something for which existence is essential has to exist. The cat doesn't have to exist. Right, but it does have to be feline, uh, and so existence is not essential to the cat. All right, and then my last question was about concepts. So I remember in your debate with Ben, as I have it up here, uh, you and Ben uh, discussed. Uh, um, uh, he mainly objected to the second presupposition, and um, you know there were times where you used the word concept and you said some habits die hard. And I remember Cameron kind of smirked a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. What are your what? Okay, so. You know, I think uh, obviously as a phenomenologist, you're going to say that you don't, we don't need concepts as like these mediating, um, I don't know if you want to call it an object, right, to engage the world, right? We can access right. something directly. So for instance, like, let's say, um, just give you an example, like I'm thinking about the chair, okay? Mm -hmm. Does the chair exist as a concept in my head? Like, is that a fair way of putting it? Or, you know, this hypothetical chair, right? Like, um, uh, you know, like, uh, what are you proposing when it comes to the uh, objection that we need concepts as understood in the, the Fragian sense, perhaps, you know, or something like that? Yeah. Um, so in my rejection of concepts, I am following uh, Robert Sokolowski, who in chapter 10 of his book, Phenomenology of the Human Person, tries to argue against the notion of mental representations and concepts and any other such uh, mediating, you know, tertium quid between consciousness and the world. Uh, of course, he's a phenomenologist. He has a specific interpretation of Husserl that he prefers, what is called the East Coast interpretation of, of Husserl. And according to this interpretation, the object of my consciousness is the same thing as the real world object. 
okay, when I see a cat, I don't see a representation of a cat. I see the cat. I don't see it all at once. I see it from a particular angle and a certain lighting and so on. Uh, but what I see is the cat. Um, I don't think that there is any need of concept. I don't need a concept in my mind uh, in virtue of which I can somehow uh, become, you know, uh, I can somehow talk about things. Uh, Robert Sokolowski makes the point that if we talk about concepts and if we accept this notion of concepts and mental representation, it'll turn out that all we really know and all we really ever talk about is our own concepts and our own ideas rather than about real things. And then, you know, you'll end up saying, well, I don't see the cat. I see a mental representation of the cat. Uh, when I'm talking about pure actuality, I'm not talking about pure actuality. I'm talking about my concept of pure actuality. Uh, and so what happens is I get stuck in this kind of what he calls an egocentric predicament, where really all I can know and really all I can talk about are things that are within the sphere of my mind, but the world out there is, is darkness to me. I don't know what it is. Um, so Kolowski says, no, this is, this is all wrong, right? There is no closed sphere of the mind. Uh, that is out, you know, sort of like separated from the world. The mind is open. The mind is an open field, and things appear to it. Now, it is true that various things can only become objects for me. I can only sort of focus my mind on them if I have various words, right? So the first thing that you know, if if you walk into somebody's house and they you see some you know strange contraption on their on their you know in their living room on the rug, you'll say, "What is this?" Right? And they give you a word. And then once you have that word, you can then begin to refer to the thing, you know, in a, in a, in a certain uh, successful way. You can begin to isolate it, um, you know, as the object of your attention and to think about it. And then you ask further questions. Well, what is it for? Oh, it's for this. What is it made out of? This. Right. So through language, uh, first of all, we give things names so that we can isolate them as objects for our consciousness. That's, that's, uh, in phenomenology, this is called constitution. Constituting an object is somehow like focusing on it and uh, you know, isolating it from everything else that is shown to you and experience so that you can consider it. Um, you know, when we first walk into a room, we, for the first time, we constitute various objects. Oh, there's a chair, there's a sofa, there's a grand piano, there's a, you know, the TV, look at how big the TV is and so on. First we have to constitute objects and then we can begin to talk about them and reason about them and so on. The word, makes it possible for you to constitute an object. When somebody tells you, what is this thing? Uh, and they give you a word, then you, uh, but you don't need concepts for any of this. You just need the right words and things to be shown to you. That's really all that matters. Um, what you need is for things to be shown to you in the environment. You need to have some sort of like immediate, you know, sensory contact with things. And then somebody can teach you the right words to use to describe things. Um, and then you can grow in your knowledge of a thing, you know, once you learn the right way of talking about it. Um, but there's no need for concepts in any of this. Right? Right. Concepts just complicate mm -hmm. things. So somebody who believes in concepts is going to tell me, listen, when you say that pure actuality is not actual, really what you are saying is that I cannot, you know, ascribe the predicate of unactuality to the concept of pure actuality. So they're, they're trying to keep me from talking about things. They're trying to keep me talking about, you know, ideas in my mind. And that's what I'm saying. No, that's not at all true. Yeah, what so, I'm talking about is the thing, the actual things out there. Yeah, so for instance, like when I think about my hypothetical chair, um, when, when you use a concept, you mean it kind of a, more in a technical sense, right? So for instance, like the hypothetical chair is a possible object that my consciousness is directly grasping, right? But when you say directly grasping, you're not meaning like it, it, it exists, like out, it has actuality, right? Because you know, some people think, right. well, if you have direct contact with something, then it has to be actual, right? That might be right. right. So I would, I would say that, no, our experience contradicts us all the time, right? So for example, um, you know, we can talk about uh, my wife and I, you know, I was excited to get married, right? I was thinking about the, the day of the wedding. And then the night before the wedding, I was hanging out with some friends, right? I wasn't going to see Rachel until the actual moment of the wedding. I was hanging out with some friends and then it hit me. I'm getting married tomorrow, right? I was not actually getting married then. I was being confronted by the weight of something that was as yet unactual, okay, but it was becoming actual. It was going to be actual. And so there I was confronted with an object that was not yet actual, right, but neither was it nothing. I wasn't getting nervous about, any, about nothing whatsoever. I was, you know, getting excited and nervous about getting married, right, which is a possible thing, which was going to become actual. Or I could, you know, I, I also 
also give the following example in the paper. Suppose you're walking through the woods and you're taking a hike and you see bear cubs, you know, some far away distance in the woods and you run away. Well, why would you run away? Because you know, if there are bear cubs there, the mama is nearby. And if the mama bear is nearby, she's going to be extremely protective of her cubs and that would present a, a, a life-threatening danger to you, right? So what caused you to run? It was not so much the bear cubs as the possibility of danger, right? That's what caused you to escape as quickly as you could because there was the possibility of serious harm. Now, obviously the possibility of serious harm is not the actuality of serious harm, right? That's, that's clear, right? You, didn't, you were not actually harmed when you saw the bears. You, set, you realized that you were possibly going to be harmed. And it was this possibility that you were trying to avoid by fleeing. So I just say that it's, it's simply not true that you know, for thought to be in contact with something, that thing has to exist in actuality. It's not true. We are in contact with possible things all the time, right? Things we anticipate, uh, things that we fear, things that we remember, which are no longer actual, right? We're still thinking about something, which is a thing. It's just not actual anymore. So that's, that's how I would respond to this objection. Just because thought is in contact with an object, it doesn't follow that the object is actual. All right, thank you, Stephen. Uh, I gotta say, this is one of actually my favorite uh, arguments for the existence of God. And uh, yeah, it was on my like top five list. I think it was like number four or something like that. Um, but yeah, this is, this is an argument that I love a lot. So Daniel, do you have any last comments before we move on to your argument? Oh yeah, well, first of all, I just wanna compliment Stephen's arguments, very original. And uh, just I, I, maybe I'm, I'm even more convinced of it than Stephen is right now. So I just think it's a wonderful argument. And um, I, I did want to issue a correction. It's axiom five. I looked it up just really quickly to make sure. Uh, but you said if something is possible, then it's necessarily possible. That's a, that's axiom five, which goes into the S five system. So just wanted to clarify in case uh, I was misleading you by saying four. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, it really gives you an understanding of phenomenology along with this sort of mystic understanding of God. And um, so yeah, just really pleasant. I see you've set me up now to talk after all that. <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right. <laughs> so uh, let's see here. Uh, Daniel, I have the uh, PowerPoint presentation. So I'll pull that up and then you'll just tell me like, you know, uh, yeah. change slide. Yeah. All right. Here we go. All right. So yeah, this is a variation on St. Anselm's ontological argument. So um, uh, I'm not here trying to give you a, uh, what I would call a, a historically accurate depiction of Anselm's argument. I think his argument's a little bit different than mine. It's a variation, it's inspired by, it takes cues from uh, St. Anselm's argument. Um, and I know a lot of people say, well, let's talk about the, the, these other arguments, these other variations, this one's in the past, but I actually think there's some reason to think St. Anselm's original formulation of the argument has some teeth. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. And here I wanted to start with talking about the definition, because I think that's so important for understanding why I think the argument is successful. Um, God is that then which none greater can be conceived. And here I want to emphasize a few things that I wanted to try to prove or talk about at least. Number one, that the definition is itself coherent. And that's gonna be important because as um, JJC Smart points out in, in one of his papers uh, on the ontological argument, he talks about the various arguments for God's existence. If you start out with the definition that is itself contains contradictions or is somehow incoherent, then it wouldn't be surprising that you are able to reach various conclusions, especially in an indirect proof in a reductio ad absurdum. If you put into your reductio an absurd definition, you could derive all sorts of things and therefore you wouldn't know if the contradiction is due to your denial of God's existence or because the very definition is itself incoherent. So you've got to really discuss the coherency of the definition. And this is a point that Leibniz makes of Descartes' own variation, right? That you have to show the possibility of God, essentially, in, in order to supplement the ontological argument. I think that's true of both Anselmian arguments and modal um, 
arguments a la Plantinga. Um, so I'm going to try to give something of a coherency argument off the bat. I also think that if you're going to talk about the definition, it has as, as a definite description, which is how I'm going to be using it. Um, and this is inspired by Robert Madol, who, who uses God as a definite description. Uh, you really have to show that it, it's unique. So I've, I've got a little argument for the uniqueness of this definition. That is that only one, one thing, if you to use the word thing, I know that we've, we've just discussed that God isn't really a thing or a this such or a, an individual properly. Uh, we're going to have to use analogical language here and just say that God is a unique thing. Um, uh, that is, this definition can really only describe one. It's not going to uh, fit over um, uh, a type or a, a kind, a, a species of things that are than which none greater can be conceived. And I'll give a little bit of an argument for that. Uh, the third point uh, is that wh why I think this uh, argument is so important is, and I don't think this is appreciated enough, is that it's an apophatic definition. That is, it's a negative definition. It, it doesn't tell us what God is in a positive sense. It really denies God as one of those things which of which a greater can be conceived. God is just not in that set. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I actually think that anticipates some objections that you find among Thomists, right? Like the, the idea that um, ontological arguments depend on having access to the essence of God that we don't have. And therefore, you're, you're trying to prove that uh, existence is somehow part of that essence. And we just, we can't a priori reason that way, because we just don't, we, we're not beholding the beatific vision. And of course, at that point, we won't be discussing ontological arguments, I think. <laughs> so, um, so it is apophatic. And I think that's actually a kind of um, supports what, what, uh, uh, Stephen's saying in, in a certain degree that we're not really talking about God as a this such. We're actually not talking about God properly. We're talking about God in a negative way uh, in the argument. And then I'm going to explain what I mean by uh, what I take to be a somewhat controversial claim is that existence isn't really the issue of the ontological argument. And, and that might seem disappointing, like, oh, so it's not a proof for God's existence it's actually assumed in a certain way that God exists. And uh, again, you're gonna say, well, this begs the question then. Well, no, what I'm gonna be arguing is that there are grades of existence and that what we have to show is that what we're talking about is within our universe of discourse. That is, it's something over which we can quantify. And uh, I'll get into that in, uh, in later slides. I just want to give an overview. So you can go to the, the next slide. Stop, stop me if something needs to be clarified, by the way. I don't, I don't know. But um, so I, I, I sort of wanted to express a, an argument for why I think this definition is coherent. Um, this is informally expressed. Um, and on the next slide, I do go into, I just show you that this actually does logically follow up. I'm not gonna actually go through the logic. I just wanted to show that uh, because some of these arguments, they have multiple premises and it's not always clear how um, those premises lead to the conclusion. But so I, I like to show the logic behind it. It's sort of just how I operate. Um, so uh, the, I'll read it and then kind of go through it. Um, the first premise states that if it's not broadly logically possible that something is the Anselmian God, then necessarily everything is such that a greater can be conceived. That is, if it's impossible, right, that there is Anselm's God, then what we would have to say is the, that the result is that everything that there is um, would be such that you could always conceive of something greater than it. And that's sort of what the first premise is saying. The second says that all, that, all things that are such that a greater can be conceived uh, all things that are such that a greater can be conceived, I think I, I have a typo there, are just in case it is conceivable that they are metaphysically complex. In other words, there's a, an equivalent, uh, it, it's a, uh, 
they're equivalent, right? So if something is such that a greater can be conceived, then they are it's conceivable that they're metaphysically complex. And, and what I'm saying is you're, you're sort of conceiving it in a way that you are stitching it together with, with the An Anselmian definition or you're, or, or, or rather, I'm sorry, what, what you, you're, you're doing is um, if it's such that a greater can be conceived than it, then you're gonna think of something and it's going to be something of where you add something to make it even greater. For example, um, you know, I might think of Spider-Man, right? Uh, and I could conceive of something greater than Spider-Man. It would be maybe Spider-Man, but he has Thor's hammer, right? And so I'm adding to it, right? I make, I'm thinking of things in more complex ways. And that's how it would be that everything could be conceivably uh, such that a greater can be conceived, right? Uh, so you could always sort of add to it. That's the second premise. The third is that if all things are conceivably metaphysically complex, then it's not the case that there's something such that it is conceivable that it is not metaphysically complex. And uh, that's just sort of a logical point. If everything is so, so such that um, it has to be conceivably metaphysically complex, you can't conceive of anything that's not that. Um, and then for there is something such that it is conceivable that it is not metaphysically complex. And the proof of that premise would simply be uh, our conception that, that Stevens talked about of a fairly actual simple being, uh, a being that lacks all metaphysical complexity, right? So those are the four premises. If you use them in tandem, you get uh, to the conclusion that it is broadly logically possible that there's something that is the Anselmian God. Um, and the next slide will show this, the deduction, but uh, I just wanted to ask if there are any questions about this sort of argument. I think that this is very clever. So if I understand you correctly, basically you are saying that the greater than relation uh, implies composition. And if there's nothing, right, that is, uh, you know, then which there's nothing greater, if there's nothing that satisfies the Anselmian definition, then everything would be metaphysically com uh, complex. Or at least conceivably uh, so, yeah. Right. Uh, but if you can conceive of something that is not metaphysically complex, uh, something for which you could not, or otherwise, but something for which you could not conceive uh, that it would be metaphysically complex, then that would, that would suggest that not everything is greater than everything else. There's not always a greater than. Yeah, there's not always going to be. Uh, yeah, so that's that very, the very fact that I can conceive of something, and here I'm using a Thomistic insight like you are, uh, the very fact that I can conceive of something divinely simple suggests the, the very possibility of the Anselmian God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This this might be like a kind of um, hair splitting, but what do we mean when we say conceive in this argument? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, after what what Stephen has said, you know, I it seems to me that what, what we're talking about is is that sort of Directed, directedness to an object. And, and one advantage that Stephen's argument has is that it cuts out the middleman and it's more simple, right? And I think a lot of people get caught up in, in whether a conception is itself uh, what we're talking about or the object to which the conception refers, right? And so, yeah, I think conceivability is just to name a certain process or, or capacity within a mind to do what Stephen's talking about. If, if I'm gonna sort of try to coax him into accepting this, it's okay, my mind can be intentionally directed towards an object, right? So that makes it conceivable. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so you're telling me that Stephen has settled the ontological argument debate and, That's right. <laughs> and that Daniel Daniel is adding on just, you know, um, very useful logic and arguments to just buttress the point. Stephen well, has like solved the issue. As, yeah, I, I think we, you know, we can see these as, as mutually supporting. I, you know, again, uh, my worry about Stephen's argument was about forcing this sort of phenomenology commitment. But I think you can translate the language of conceivability into something uh, similar to what Stephen's talking about. And 
Uh, I think I, I made a joke to my cinema, uh, a private message weeks ago, where I said, well, Anselm's definition could be translated as God is that than which none more intentional, right? That than which none is none more, uh, or that than which is uh, none more, uh, none greater can be intentionally directed to or something like that. You know, where mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saying, you know, get rid of the conceivability if you want. Uh, and, you know, cut out the middleman. Wow. Let's East Coast phenomenology. That's fine. Um, but yeah, that's all I'm talking about is this uh, capacity of the mind to be directed to some object. Now, again, does that object exist in actuality is not going to be assumed yet. And at this point, I'm just sure. talking about the mere coherence of the definition, wow. that it is logically possible to say that there's something identical to G, where G is identified as uh, the thing such that none greater can be uh, conceived. Yeah, I never realized how much of a, a, a little devil uh, concepts are. I don't know, <laughs> uh, Stephen, are you going to add that to your list of the great Satan's concepts? The great Satan's of, of analytic philosophy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Analytic, uh, first, first order predicate logic and concepts. Yeah, I think I should definitely do that. All right. Daniel, back to you. Oh, yeah, sure. So you can go to the next slide. We've talked a little bit about the coherence. Uh, now I'm going to offer an argument for why I think the definition provides us with something unique. That is, uh, I can properly use a definite description uh, to identify one thing. And what I say is that if two things have the same description, then it's conceivable that there is a myriological sum of the two, right? Where, where they're kind of added together. Uh, and if it's conceivable that there's a myriological myriological sum of two things with the same description, then the sum is conceivably greater than any two parts. That's going to be my contention, at least in, in some respect, right? There's two of them. They're greater in quantity. They're, they're somehow, you know, you can, you can um, add their powers together, so to speak, right? Two is better than one. <laughs> Something like that. Um, so let's suppose two Anselmian individuals. Again, don't fret over the individual thing there. Um, four, it would be conceivable that there is a myriological sum of the two Anselmian beings. The myriological sum could be conceivably greater than any of the two Anselmian definitions. Therefore, it is impossible that something be greater than, an, or because it's impossible that something be greater than an Anselmian individual, there are not two, right? So that's the idea is, um, it's a sort of thing that there can only be one. Um, and you, you sort of see this also with proofs for like why there could only be one omnipotent being, right? If there are more than one, uh, you're, you're starting to get contradictions into the system. So I think that that's another way you could get to this. But that's what I'm doing here is trying to say that Anselm's definition doesn't really give you uh, a potential for polytheism. It's really a monotheistic proof, right? And um, this might be a way of cashing that out. Any questions about this one? Stephen, no? Okay. If not, I can... So I, I have a question. Um, yeah? Basically, so you say that, okay, so if there are two things that satisfy the same description, then the sum of them is conceivably greater than either of them individually. Um, can you have basically, like, I, I suppose, you know, maybe something you might call like greatness over determination, where you have two things that satisfy the same description, but when you add them together, it doesn't get any better than just to put them separately? Sure. And I'm not sure that's a big... Um, so that's conceivable, but I guess the, the point would be, it's at least conceivable that they'd be greater, right? So in other words, that possibility of it, of thinking of it in a way that's greater uh, would undercut. So you could maybe think of examples where um, two are not as great in some way, but in other ways they might be greater, right? And that would be enough to really be a problem here. I don't know if that answers the question, but... Um, so the idea is just that the, the sum would, in some way or other, be greater than either of them taken individually. Yes, yeah. There would be okay. two, two things of infinite worth, say, uh, when it comes to, um, and you might say, well, one thing of infinite worth is equal to 
too, I suppose, or something like that. You could probably argue something like that, but um, there's got to be some sense in which, and, and here I, I guess I'm, I'm dealing with a counter possibility here, thinking what I think is impossible, but um, just to think in, in terms of, I think as a general principle, when you see two things, right, uh, that have the same description, in other words, they have the same kind of essence or the same, uh, the same definition of some sort, and then you, you can sort of group them together and say, well, there's, uh, there's two of them. There, and, and it seems that at least in some sense, the two-ness of it would be greater um, just in quantity, uh, just with respect to that category. And um, so that's sort of my intuition there. And I, I know that this isn't this is somewhat of a controversial argument, I think. I, I'm throwing a bunch of things at the wall. So uh, forgive me if, if, uh, if it's not completely um, worked out, but in terms of all, anticipating all objections, but this is the core insight I have when I think of the Anselmian argument and why it doesn't lead to many gods. I think it, it has to be one because if you have two, and, and I could say, well, there are two things such than both of them together, wouldn't that be greater? Wouldn't it be great? And this is sort of worn out from an insight about the idea of, well, what about the Anselmian god and the world and creation, isn't that greater than the Anselmian God? And the answer has to be no, right? That the world plus the Anselmian God can't be greater than the Anselmian God. And that sort of tells you the greatness of the Anselmian God, right? Is, is such that adding things to it um, could never increase the greatness. And yet it seems to me, at least my intuition is that if you had if you have two things of the same description, then there is some sense of greatness there. That's at least conceivable, this muriological sum, the two of them together, this composition would be greater. So one thing you might say is that uh, the greatness consists in this. If there are two of them and one of them happens to die or to pass away, then at least you have one left. <laughs> right. So that, that would be one way in which, you know, the, uh, the sum of them seems to have, you know, more, uh, uh, you know, if, if there are two of them, then one of them can die and we're not left without, without the greatness, if there are two of them. Right? So yeah. that would be a way in which a sum of things would be better than just one of them. Uh, you could have well, a backup. And, and what, I'm, what I'm happy to say is, look, you have two things that are under the same species. Therefore, you have a sense in which the composition of them is two, is greater than one just numerically. Just numerically, they're, that's a greater number of things right. matching that description. And that I think is sufficient to say, well, there's a problem with that when you're trying to count things that are described in the Anselmian way. You can't do that. You can't have a quantity of them is, is yeah. the issue. I, th I think, right. yeah. So anyways, that's my argument for uniqueness. You could probably generate others. One of them might be, again, as I said, the Anselmian definition seems to lead to Omni properties that get a little funky when you start multiplying them, right? You have two omniscient beings both wanting to do different things, you have problems. So that's the uniqueness argument that I'm offering, anyways. Um, next slide, I guess. Again, this is a point I made the definition's apophatic. The Anselmian description is not a positive description, but a negative one. It's, it says that God is not one of those things of which a greater can be conceived. And I think that's going to be significant here. The description divides our universe, our universe of, that should say discourse, I apologize for the typo, into those things of which a greater can be conceived and those uh, things of which a greater cannot be conceived, which we have now the reason to suppose has at least one instance, right? So there, you, you we're basically dividing everything that, that our, our argument will range over, okay? And we're saying the Anselmian being is on one side, and then there are things on the other side. And we, we, we have reason to think it's one. There's one of them, okay? Uh, so I, I think that's generally straightforward. So maybe the next slide. So this is where I think this is kind of my original contribution to this discussion. 
Um, this is my map of reality. And again, these layers can be somewhat controversial. Um, and I, I was actually toying around with how I might reallocate things. And it, it's sort of going to depend on your metaphysics. But the basic overarching point is uh, there's some sort of layeredness to uh, reality. This is something that a, a Thomist might be happy with in the sense that you have gradations of being in the uh, fourth way, right? Um, th that, you know, there's a sense in which um, things can exist more or less, right? They can be uh, true more or less. And we we saw that with the, the potential danger that Stephen is in when he walks in the woods, right? That, that seems to be less true than actual danger, right? There's something, there's gradation here of being. So what I have in the sort of the starry area is what I call the complete universe of discourse. That is the, the what we're ranging over when we have any sort of argument. And what I'm gonna argue is that this is effectively uh, going to map onto what Anselm calls existence in intellectu, that is in, uh, mental existence or in intellectual existence. This is everything we could talk of. And then if you go in one concentric uh, circle, we have the possible, which is within our universe of discourse. So we could imagine in the, in the stars out there, we have impossibilia, which I don't think are actually nothing. Okay, impossible objects are not nothing. They aren't not anything. They're actually things that we can quantify over and we can discuss. We can talk about round squares and things that we do that all the time, actually. So I, I really, I, so if you ask me in some sense, do impossible objects exist? I would say, yes, they're out here in our universe of discourse. That is, I can say, I can use the, the locution, there is, there is an object that is impossible and has roundness and squareness or something like that. And I can sort of, it, it, it doesn't make, it's not possible, it maybe isn't coherent, but it's at least something that I can still quantify over. So it's, that's what I would call very thin sort of existence. And inside there would be the possible objects. And here I had a debate, do I do real or possible? And uh, um, because I'm not, a, um, uh, I'm not a modal realist, I put real inside the possible, uh, but if you're more like David Lewis, you might put the real out here and say what divides is between the real and the, the non-real and then inside that the possible. But I, I wanna say that there are possible objects that are not real. And I'm actually going to make a distinction between possible objects and potentials, which uh, actually get out here. So there are possible objects inside that the real, um, and the real outside here might include things, I think that abstract objects are real, okay? They're, they're real objects, they're just not concrete. They don't have causal power, say. Um, and then we have the concrete objects. These would be things that have causal power, just loosely speaking. Um, within that, we might talk about what is actual, um, and that might include uh, Stephen, and I and so on, right? And all the sort of actual objects. Uh, beyond that, um, necessary. Now you might say, what about the abstract objects over here? They're, they're sort of necessary too. I actually wanna, uh, you know, I have to work that out, but I, 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 I wanna say that abstract objects don't have the same sort of necessary, it seems to be a, a, an equivocation. The necessity of an abstract object seems to be some other type of thing. So um, I just kind of wanna bracket that conversation and say, there are necessary actual concrete objects. And these things would be, uh, you know, things that range over every possible world, say, or, um, and I don't take those, that to include just God, or at least I don't think it has to just include God. And then I wanna say within that, there's the simple. And the simple is that which, whose essence is the same as, existence, right? The, the sort of uh, what we talk about when we talk about classical theism, which implies necessity and actuality and uh, by causal power concreteness. And so you can see that there's actually a certain sense in which what is simple has a very thick form of existence, what I call thick existence, uh, in that it has all these other senses of existence. It's real, right? Say God is real to me is not enough because it could be a real abstract object, 
to say God is possible is obviously enough for the proof. What you really want to say, uh, I think it gets interesting around actual, right? When you say God is an actual concrete object, um, there you're getting somewhere. Um, so that's, this is sort of the gradations of being that I think are really important to understand when we're going through the argument itself. Are there any questions about this map? So I remember that, Daniel, you said that this might be controversial, and I'm interested in where someone might think it's controversial um, well, or have hesitations. A lot of people think that existence is like being pregnant, right? You, you either, exi either something exists or doesn't. And I think that sort of mentality is actually what led to the Parmenidean problem of trying to understand change, uh, how to understand Stephen's potential danger, right? So we have to distinguish between different modes of, of being. But a lot of people actually want to say that to exist or to be there is the same as being real, for example. I, and when I've run this argument to skeptics before, they often say, well, as soon as you use the existential quantifier and talk about God, that's enough. You've, you've given up the game. You've begged the question. And I want to say that simply saying there is, a, there is an Anselmian God is not enough. That's not really the debate. Uh, I think everyone in the world should agree there is an Anselmian God. The question is, do you place it out here in the impossibilia? Do you place it merely in the possibilia? Is it real but abstract? As I've seen some, there was a, a cartoon I saw recently, and it was God looking at a map of heaven, and it was actually someone's brain or someone's head, and it said, you are here, right? Well, that's a claim that God exists, but God exists, what, as a, I dare I say, a concept or as, a, as a, an object of intentionality that doesn't correspond to anything actual, right, as, as Stephen would, would grant, uh, in, in, at least in my expression there, right, that God isn't really, um, well, God isn't concretely in existence. So, yeah, I, I think it's controversial in the sense that what I would say is people have um, bad ontology. <laughs> I think people really, you know, I, it goes back to what Stephen, you have objections about first order logic. I do because uh, we have all sorts of problems with how to, how to um, make existential claims in logic. We have, do we use an existential quantifier? Do we use that plus an identity relation? Is existence a predicate? Is it a mode? What, what exactly is it? And what I, what I think the problem is, is it depends on the context. In other words, what I say is everything exists. It just is a question of how it exists. Everything exists. You can't tell me something that doesn't exist. And again, with my point about impossible objects, yeah, I think they, they are because we talk about them. They, they're part of our discourse. Okay, uh, any other points before I move on? Okay. No, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think what you say is, is right. Um, you talk about a universe of discourse. Uh, of course, when I hear universe of discourse, I hear, you know, categorical judgments. Um, and then I think like, okay, well, that requires like a pre-given object and intentionality on the rest. But I agree with you, right? Like not everything that we talk about exists in actuality. Not everything that we talk about is concrete and so on, um, you know, and, and we have to like pay more attention, pay closer attention to what it is that we're talking about and how it is that we come across it in the first place so that we can know the right way to talk about it, whether as impossible or as, um, as possible or else as actual, as concrete or as abstract and so on. So I, I'm on board with you here. In mm -hmm. this yeah, and, and again, I'm, I'm willing to adjust some of these circles and grant that there's probably more you know, this sort of cone that forms. And actually I was sort of thinking, the, the interesting thing is if you get to this idea, then it's actually what's at the top, what most absolutely exists, grounds the whole, the whole rest of the set. There's a sense of, uh, as you get, as you go in, then the relationship outward is actually one of grounding. So it's sort of, that, that's my idea anyways. Um, yeah, I was, gonna, I was gonna say too, that, you know, someone might be thinking, well, you know, why should I accept all these distinctions when I can have a much simpler view of reality, right? So as you put it, like some of the skeptics uh, that you've argued against have just said, well, once you say there is, then that's all you need, right? And you're saying that 
with more precision, we start getting into all these nuances. And it's not just we're adding arbitrarily right onto uh, the, the universe of discourse, but we're, we're more precisely uh, fine tuning our ontology for these sorts of yeah. things. Yeah. Well, that's what I find. I, you know, we talk about ontological arguments, but I find that very little ontology is discussed when people t talk about ontological arguments. Yeah. Have you ever noticed that? They don't talk <laughs> when they're talking about ontological arguments. They just, I mean, rudimentary, well, there's being in the mind and being in reality or something like that, or, you know, you know, necessary existence, possible existence. But I really want to draw out, well, we have to have a robust sense of ontology that there are grades here. And, um, you know, for, for me, I, I'm, I'm influenced by um, a professor of mine, uh, we, uh, Father Ron Ticelli, who at Boston College, he, and I remember we had a conversation where he said, it seemed to him that the fourth way and the ontological argument touched, they kind yeah. of meet, right? And, and so maybe I'm taking a cue from that. This idea of these grades of being are, will actually help us understand the ontological argument. All right, Dan, you ready to move on? Yes, I think so. Okay, so this is where I, Understanding this, I think, will help us understand free logic. Um, what is free logic? Free logic is free of existential import, which again is problematic, right? What, what I think free logic should be uh, free of is free of ontological commitment to the higher grades of, of reality. I'm, in free logic, I can, I can talk about Sherlock Holmes, right? I can say Sherlock Holmes has um, has a hat and solves crimes and is the greatest detective the world has ever seen and is fictional. You know, so much of the 20th century, people are, have trouble with these sort of non-existent objects. What they should say is they're non-real. They're just not real. They, do they exist? Sure, sure, Sherlock Holmes exists. He's a fictional object, fictional being. So what I want to say is I, I'm kind of using this idea of a free logic where there is that locution, the existential quantifier, doesn't tell you where in the map the object falls. It just is telling you that it's within our universe of discourse. It's something we're talking about here. It's something we're, we're going to be able to quantify over. Um, what I wanna say is therefore, there is means it's part of our universe of discourse includes this, right? Something like that. And so a lot of my, formulations of the argument actually are inspired by um, Madel, who uses um, free logic in setting up Anselm's argument. So I wanted to take a quote from, this is from the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. He writes, uh, the presupposition is that something, some referring singular term and definite descriptions could be free of existential import. That is that it claims that it really exists, okay? And quantifiers should be allowed to range over possibilia. Otherwise, some referential terms that refer to non-mental things such as God and the being then which none greater can be conceived would have to refer to mental things that have existence in the understanding, which makes no sense. Or those re referential terms would have to refer to things which have existence in reality, which would make the Anselmian ontological argument beg the question. So actually using free logic or using a logic that is free of existential implications, um, as we're talking about here, that, that as soon as you use the existential quantifier, you're placing the object within a certain position on that map, it will beg the question. So you have to just be neutral. And that's what I have to insist on, is the context under which my argument is going to be developed. Okay? Wow, I just find it really phenomenal that that one little nuance changes everything. Yeah, it, it really, well, it also gives you an insight to why people think the argument traditionally begs the question, because what they're sensing is that you're already insisting that this being in question is, that you have to use the existential quantifier somehow, you have to, um, you have to, in a reductio, um, already posit that this God has a contradictory property and that seems to suggest, well, there is such a God and it has a contradiction. And so in rejecting that contradiction, you still have the God that you're positing in the reductio. Uh, and that will be clear, I guess, in, in the next few slides. But what I'm saying is 
it's not enough to say there is a, an Anselmian God. And, and so my proof is trying to get to a thicker notion of existence. This is all preamble. <laughs> so there is an Anselmian God within our discourse. The existence of the Anselmian God is not in question. It is the grade or mode of God's existence that is. We will treat it exists in intellectu as, a, as is present in our universe discourse. That is, uh, th that's how I'm sort of inspired by Anselm. Uh, rather than talking about the objects of our mind, I just want to say it's the object within our logical discourse. This does not treat existence as a predicate, uh, though certain modes of existence, I think, are predicates or can be treated as uh, predicates. So when, when I say something is real, I think I can predicate realness to it or uh, concreteness or actuality, I think could be, uh, and this I might vary with uh, uh, Stephen a little bit, um, we'd have to discuss that. Um, but I could say of a thing that it is actual, that's all I mean. Or I could say of a thing that it is necessary. And Plantinga uses that idea that, well, I'm not using existence as a predicate, I'm using necessity as a predicate, right? There's necessary existence, and that's part of what I'm predicating of maximal greatness. And then the question is whether the Anselmian God has a robust form of existence, i.e. exists in a real, concrete, actual, necessary, and simple manner. That's the question I want to, to get at. I don't care about trying to say there is an Anselmian God. Of course there is. That's what we're talking about, right? So, okay, on to the next slide then. Here's I the- I just want to say very briefly, if I can. Uh, to me, it's extremely fascinating how uh, easily translatable our two arguments are, at least uh, most of the yeah. points that we're making at this point. Because where yeah. you speak of like a, a universe of discourse and the, you know, the existential quantifier is not ontologically committing or whatever, I speak of pre-given, you know, pre-categorial objects of thought uh, and, um, you know, uh, the intentionality. So we're really saying more or less the same thing, although we use different concepts and we, you know, concepts and we sort of approach it from different backgrounds, nevertheless, what we're saying seems to be very consonant. I, I agree. I was thinking the same thing during your presentation. So, um, all right. So here's the argument itself. Um, if something exists incompletely, that is, is non-simple, necessary, actual, concrete, real. <laughs> okay. And, and sort of, that's what I mean by complete, would be having all of those properties. So, the comp if something exists as a complement to what exists completely, then a greater can be conceived. If so, that's the first premise. The second premise all things exist either incompletely or absolutely completely. And then the conclusion, therefore, the Anselmian God exists absolutely com completely. Um, now, that doesn't seem obviously deductively sound, but um, we're, we're going to have to go to the next slide to show this. This is sort of the argument. Um, informally expressed. And I understand some of the audience might not have all the predicate logic under their belt to get this, but I do have to kind of show some of this just to show what's going on. Um, so pay particularly attention to the premises. I'm going to try to speak out what, what they say. Um, so for all X, if X exists incompletely, then it is conceivable that there is something, uh, some Y that is greater than X. That's the first premise. I also say that for all X, something either exists incompletely or absolutely completely. Those are the two premises that I stated. And then I got to this conclusion, which you see down at 13, God exists completely. Now, how did I get there? At three, I make an assumption, which I represent as an indirect proof assumption right there, that God exists incompletely. Now, I'm not going to say where on the map, but maybe... God is impossible. We already ruled that out with my premise for the coherence or broad logical possibility of God. But let's say God exists at least in the possible, maybe in the abstract range. Okay, so incomplete. If God is incomplete, then by one, a greater can be conceived. That's what we have at four. And so I can derive from my initial assumption that God is incomplete, that I can conceive of something greater than God, okay? I then unpack this, and this is why it was so important to show that this is a definite description G here, that little G in line five, is, it, is a definite description. I know 
uh, Bertrand Russell's rolling in his grave right now that I would use an existential or, or I use a definite description for God. But with a free logic, I don't see the problem, right? Because I'm not saying that G exists in reality. I'm just saying it, G is part of our discourse. So what you're then saying, and here, Stephen, my head's tingling again with how our arguments are uh, supportive, right? When you unpack five, what you're saying is that there is an X such that it is not conceivable that there's any Y greater and also, when you get down here, this is the uniqueness claim, right? That anything that is like that would be X. And also, what? That it's conceivable that there is something greater than it. Okay? So you're saying contradictory things of X. Okay? Since we know X is possible, we can't chalk that up to the impossibility realm of our discourse. That's going to kick it all the way up, I think, right? So what we're going to see here is as I unpack it, the rest of this logic is just to show you that by line 10, we have a direct contradiction in our logic, right? It is both such that uh, this thing is nothing greater can be conceived than it, and also that there is something greater than, that can, than can be conceived than it. And that means that you have to reject the initial assumption, which is that God is not, uh, uh, which is that God is uh, incomplete. So you get by line uh, 11, God is not uh, incomplete. And by uh, premise two, we can then instantiate that general claim that if the, that of everything, it's, it's either incomplete or complete. Therefore, we can conclude, conclude that God exists completely. Um, and by completely, uh, as I explained before, that's going to put God in the center ring in my little map of existence, which is what I think we really need to prove when we're talking about God. How does God exist? God exists simply. And I think that's an even more robust claim than anything uh, Plantinga says when, when he says God exists necessarily or maximal, or is maximally great. Um, my, my objection to the modal ontological argument is not one of modal logic, I actually think it's fine. It, it's, it's rather this non-apophatic attempt to kind of uh, piece together a concept of God um, in a positive manner, uh, which raises all sorts of questions about uh, whether his definition is coherent in a way that I think an apophatic definition can beg off. You know, I, I really just talking about something in contradistinction to other things. So anyways, uh, I think that's the last slide. Did I put anything else beyond that? Oh, objections. <laughs> okay. Um, well, maybe before I go back there, should I, should I uh, ask, are there any questions about what I've said so far? So I have just a, a brief suggestion. Sean, if you can go back to the formulation of the argument, not the logical proof, but the, the simple formulation. Couldn't you just say that, um, you know, if something exists incompletely, then a greater can be conceived? Uh, you know, the Anselmian God is, you know, uh, one than which no greater can be conceived. Therefore, the Anselmian God does not con exist incompletely. Would that not be enough to, to prove your argument or to prove your point? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that would be a little bit more, uh, maybe more helpful in my informal expression. I, I, I was trying to be somewhat shocking in just showing that those two premises alone get you. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Right, but but so I can state those two premises without even mentioning the Anselmian God. And then the, by, by virtue of the fact that the Anselmian God exists within our universe of discourse as a possible being, we can plug it in to uh, the indirect proof and get our conclusion. Now, I think you can only do that if you at least show that the Anselmian God is coherent, is broadly logically yeah. possible. Um, I, in other words, I, and, and this is going to be very important when I get to talk about parodies. But you, your point is well taken. Um, it, it's really not evident from those two premises that the conclusion follows, unless you say, uh, I could say either the Anselmian God exists incompletely or completely, and that would do the same job. Yeah. No, I like it. Um, uh, so I like the shock factor of it. So. <laughs> Although, although it, it, it's not as, you know, I was thinking like, how would I formulate this argument for my 101 students, right? I wouldn't put it exactly like this, but yeah, you, I appreciate you, the shock factor, you know, for a more formal presentation. Yeah, so it, for, for a 101, I would put in, in two, 
I would instantiate that with the Anselmian God, right? And then it becomes clear, right? Either the Anselmian God exists incompletely or absolutely completely. And there, by the way, the absolutely completely, I'm borrowing from Bonaventure's uh, formulation of the ontological argument. He talks about absolute complete existence. And uh, so I'm, I'm taking a little inspiration from him as well. <laughs> so there. Okay, can, can we go to the objections? Um, so parodies. What I'm going to say about parodies is they always must be conceived in terms of metaphysical complexity. The Anselmian descriptor plus F, right, where F is some property, right? The, the cat then, which none greater can be conceived. The island then, which none greater can be conceived. And thus, not broadly logically possible, right? Why? Uh, because you're saying of it, I, I would say what it leads to is since it's metaphysically complex, you can think of something great. You can always think of something greater by the fact that it's metaphys metaphysically complex, right? And this, I think, ties on to Stephen's point of the this such being, you know, uh, is itself a complexity that you're kind of, you can't just willy nilly add actual uh, pure actuality to it, as if that could be part of the such. And here I, I'm kind of coming to a similar conclusion that the Anselmian descriptor, whether it's a, 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 a this or rather a such, um, it doesn't matter. What I'm saying is once you add to it this F, you're getting something that you're conceiving of in, in terms of complexity. Uh, and I would say that it's actually impossible for an island to be then that then which none greater can be conceived. Or what I would say is it leads to an ambiguity are you saying that it is insofar as it's an island or, or simply, simpliciter? Is it, is it that if it's the former, then I have no idea what you're talking about. An island, that qua island is greater than can be conceived. I can always conceive of a greater island than whatever I'm conceiving, uh, right? Like, like in the, the movie or the, the TV show Lost, right? Uh, an island that can transport itself across space and time and can make polar bears at will. Well, that doesn't seem like an island at a certain point. And so you start to leave the island, the, that, those properties, those sets of properties of islandness behind, and you just start focusing on really God uh, in, incarnated as an island, I suppose. I mean, that, that's really what I'm talking about. Uh, I, I once had the thought that what, what these parodies actually just show is that God can incarnate. <laughs> That's a, that's all parody does, right? The baseball player then uh, none greater can be conceived as just uh, uh, God incarnating as the best possible baseball player. <laughs> okay. um, anyways, so I think parodies actually fail for that reason. Uh, I, so I want to say just very briefly, this is an excellent discussion. I think this is an exactly right discussion of the parody objection. Um, okay. And I, yeah. I think it meshes nicely with what I'm saying. Good. You know, that's a great confirmation. Um, two, the second objection, uh, you can't define something into existence. Almost every time I um, present an ontological argument, I get this objection. You can't define something into existence. And part of me just wants to say, hold my beer, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so watch me, <laughs> right? Uh, who says, right? Uh, and, and I think it, it's the point that, that Stephen was making before about the this such. You can't define a this such into existence. You can't define something of which Hume says you could always deny the existence of into existence. Um, and so what I take this objection to essentially be is that there can't be ontological or a priori arguments for facts. And I would say, well, that's broadly true except in the case of God. And I actually think it's apt that God is the one thing for which this sort of argument would work. Um, it, how appropriate that of all the things, only God is susceptible to an a priori demonstration. So uh, I think that's fitting. Actually, I actually have an argument from fittingness that uh, an, if an argument, if there's something fitting about an argument, then that's a cer certain sign of its, um, that's a sort of abductive sign of its um, truth. And therefore uh, we should grant it some degree of epistemic possibility. And if we do that, then we should be epistemically committed to the possibility of the thing. 
and therefore epistemically committed to the existence of the ontology of the uh, existence of such a God. Um, but that's that's a separate argument. Uh, we, maybe we can talk about it some other time. Uh, my my main point here is that if if you want to say it's this is my challenge, basically to anyone who says it defines God into existence. What you really need to say is it defines God into absolute complete existence. And I want you to show that from a zero premise argument. A zero premise argument would use the definition alone and the laws of logic without any of my ontological premises to arrive at the same conclusion. And I assure you that that's not going to be forthcoming. You need the ontological premises in order to make sense of where this definition is placed on the map. Uh, I don't, I, I simply will say it's impossible to prove from the definition alone that God exists in an absolutely complete manner. Um, third, the argument begs the question. This is sort of the Thomistic response. Um, it's also one that you often hear, uh, I think even uh, Alvin Plantinga is very close to saying that it, his own argument begs the question, because once you grant that God is possible, you already granted God exists, and therefore the possibility premise just is the conclusion <laughs> with a few logical maneuvers. It's logically equivalent. The one premise is logically equivalent to the, the conclusion if the one premise is um, or, yeah, if you have a premise like God, God possibly exists, and then by S5, therefore God exists in actuality, right? So a lot of people are suspicious of these sorts of arguments that, that they're question begging. And my response is simply that absolute complete, absolutely complete existence is not explicitly in the definition of the Anselmian God, but in tandem with the premises leads to the conclusion that the Anselmian God exists in, in an absolutely complete manner. So I don't think it begs the question. And all I'd have to, I'd have to see it for myself. Uh, and so this is similar to the cannot define something into existence. Show me that I'm doing that. I have yet to see someone show me that. They say it, and then I challenge them. I say, do a zero premise argument to demonstrate this to me. And I, they, don't, they don't know how to do that. So I'm just going to have to say that until I have the proof, uh, I'll use the, the, uh, the Hitchens uh, razor, right? That which is asserted without evidence can be uh, what denied without evidence. Show me, show me the evidence that it's be question begging. And then uh, the last point, existence is not a predicate. And I said, this depends on the sort of, uh, on the sort of existential claim one is making. There is really in indicates what is in our discourse. And depending on the nature of the discourse, this can get, carry very degrees of existential import. So if, you're, if your logic is not a free logic and your universe of, or your discourse is restricted to talking of or ranging over real objects or actual objects, then yes, uh, ex, you'd make an existential claim with the existential quantifier and not a predicate. But free logic tends to allow for the use of predicates when talking about existence. Therefore, I think free logic is the appropriate logic for doing these sorts of proofs because it's going to be the only logic that's neutral. Um, and uh, so what else do I say? Modes of existence typically are allowed to be treated as kinds of predications as we see in the modal ontological argument, which treats necessary existence as an attribute which is contained in maximal gradients. So that's my response to those four common objections. So I know that uh, Stephen has to go pretty soon, but um, okay, so this is kind of out of the blue, but yeah, I mean, we've covered so many objections. There's just one that kind of still is on my mind. So in some of the literature that I've read, that is definitely beyond my pay grade as of now, um, I've heard various people say, well, no, no, we, we can't do the ontological argument no matter what form, because modal collapse. And I'm interested, like, where, where does modal collapse come into this? And is this an actual a defeater, let's say, to the ontological argument. So for instance, like Daniel, for your argument, would modal collapse pose a problem or? I, I, I'm not aware of, I mean, unless you're saying in general that God is, a, the existence of God threatens modal collapse. Is that the claim? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I remember like, um, 
uh, I forgot who the author was, but like, um, you know, I've, I've had several atheists tell me, well, no, 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 like when we put this in the computer, eventually we see it gets us modal collapse. So we can't accept the ontological argument. I need to flesh this claim out more, but it's something yeah. that I've heard. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just not aware of why that would be. Uh, so I can't really respond. Okay. So we can get to a simple God, basically whose essence is existence without having to deal with the modal collapse argument. Is that you know, I, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm going to punt to, to sure. for Tom, Tomaszewski's uh, point that let's see uh, a valid formulation of a modal collapse argument get off the ground first. Sure, yeah. I agree with his response that it involves, uh, the, the ones formulated that I've seen involve uh, um, modal fallacies. Um, I disagree with Stephen and, and, and Christopher on how to solve these problems a little bit, because I know that they use the diff, what is it, the difference principle, or they object to the difference principle. And um, I don't, uh, at least my own answer is a little different, but it's not completely worked out. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think there are plenty of grounds for, for responding to it. Steven, do you want to say anything real quick? I know that you have to go pretty soon. The one thing that I would say, I generally am in agreement with Daniel's argument, and I think it's really great. The one thing that I think would improve your argument, Daniel, is if you um, take this universe of discourse and this linguistic logical stuff uh, and give it a phenomenological spin by saying that when we talk, we're not talking about objects right, that are in our minds. We're talking about things. right? So if you can translate this universe of discourse into the universe that we encounter in consciousness um, and you know, justify the distinction between these uh, different modes of existence experientially, for example, like through the experience of things as possible or as impossible or whatever. Uh, if you can do basically a bit like provide a kind of a phenomenological grounding of this, uh, of this argument, then I think we're basically saying exactly the same thing and, and it's, it's uh, as far as I'm concerned, really the only, you know, promising uh, formulation of the ontological argument. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm happy to, um, to concede that, well, first of all, that it is a, a point of confusion that, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of a concept, you know, uh, I, when I talk to students about Platonism, for example, and we, we talk about, well, what is five, and they'll say, well, five's a concept. And I say, well, what's it a concept of, right? And they say, what do you mean? And I say, well, it's, concepts are of things. What's it a concept of, right? If they say five again, then I'm saying, well, you just said it's a concept. So you're saying it's a concept of a concept, and what, are you going to do that forever? You have to get to something, right? So what is that thing you get to? That's what I'm talking about when I talk about five. And I think in a similar way, we somehow and I, I agree this is a problem of, of analytic philosophy, somehow we, we've, we're lost in our heads, right? And we're lost uh, in thinking, are these objects or are, are these individuals, are these concrete things or whatever you wanna call them, are they mentally existing uh, or, or do they have some sort of real existence outside of the mind? Maybe that has to be included in my map, you know, that, um, that there might be something like mental objects, and that's not what we're talking about here. Um, our, our logic has to range over more than just mental. Otherwise, yeah, what, what's the point of doing any logic? We're just really just um, we're just formalizing our psychology, something like that. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen, so much for this conversation. It has truly been wonderful. Do you mind if I call this two ontological proofs of the existence of God, or was that seem too uh, immodest? I think it's not really like two different <laughs> proofs. Uh, I would say, you know, maybe two takes on the ontological proof. Okay, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll figure something out, yeah. Two perspectives, or yeah, two, uh, yeah. Okay, two I got something. <laughs> Thank you so much, gentlemen, for this conversation. Stephen, enjoy your um, your uh, your upcoming event. And Daniel, thank you so much for spending time with us. Same to you, Stephen. Thank you. You have a good one. Thank you.